Welcome to another edition of The Growth Engine with Ryan and Trice. Ryan, what's up, buddy? How you doing, Trice? I'm doing great. Great. Great topic this afternoon. So let's dive in. Tell us a little bit about what you're talking about over there. Well, I've got a bunch of new uh, coaching clients, and that's what brought this topic to the forefront. Um, some smaller companies, um, for sure. But I do, I do this thing uh, with some of my clients that's the first session is called the clarity session um, or company snapshot. It says at the top of the page that, that we try to uh, get, get through and go through and clarity session is interesting. When I say that a lot of people think about a, a lot of different things It's a real broad topic, but I start with really, really simple basics. And so today I'm going to talk about what these basics are. And we'll talk about how they, how they blow up, uh, how, how they actually uh, upset the, the norm. Uh, they challenge people and leadership teams and how, how this process leads to real clarity before you can actually start strategy and you know, mission and core values and all these things that people do, right? <clears throat> so right. Um, some people call this a dis discovery, but this isn't necessarily discovery. This is actually something I do with these teams that identifies who they are. So when I say snapshot, like it's a, it's a quick snapshot, right? Here's what we, here's what we do. And cool. so it starts with, it starts with like the products and not everybody has products. Some have just services. services some have right. products and services, right? This is a time we set in bullet point on a list. Here's the products that we, that we offer. And then we stack them in like the highest, most important, you know, we, we uh, will prior prioritize them. Right. And say, this is the main thing we do. And then this, and then this, and we do the same thing with the services. And so I've had people say, well, wait a minute. Why don't you just send me that document over and I'll just fill it out. Or can't you just go to the website and get that off the website? <laughs> this is the problem actually is if I did that, I would be skipping some really important stuff because most of the time the site is out of date. No, um, it doesn't show everything <laughs> and it doesn't represent, I mean, who built the site, right? Sometimes it's their first site, second site, whatever. I've yeah, seen sites that they're on their 10th really. one yeah. and it still doesn't have everything they do on it or in the, it's not representing the right order. And in most companies, I try to uh, coach them that there's usually one major anchor thing they do, service. Sure. And then the rest are like, add on type of things, but yeah. on the website, they're all represented equally across the board. So number one thing is we just get down their products and services in, a, in order. That's it. Yeah. 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 Um, having gone through this process with you, I will say you're, you, to your point, you could give them questionnaires and homework ahead of time. And it doesn't hurt to do that, obviously, like in, like in these cases, but you still want to talk about it because you do need to prioritize certain things. And you're right. This, the site is hundred percent not going to be up to date. There's no way. Um, I haven't 10 years of the last 10 years of marketing. I can guarantee the site was not hundred percent the vast yeah. majority of that time. So, yeah. So, okay. So you got products and services. You start asking questions. What's, what's your next question? Well, we don't get to that very quickly. <laughs> I'm on number one. And yeah. so these sessions usually last, um, you know, if they're in, you know, small, like I'm only dealing with one or two people in a company, right? Sure. The CEO or the owner and, and like his right hand man, right? This can, this is, could be a 90 minute to two hour session. Um, it's weird how this very first thing takes up the first 60 minutes sometimes. Mm. And, and so what I see happen on this one is if you have a leadership team, uh, together, they actually start fighting right there. You're on step one. They start fighting about the products, and here's what happens: <clears throat> about what, which was the priority. Well, they'll they'll they'll, they'll argue about that for sure because yeah. they'll argue whether or not it's the entry product, the thing that people ordered the most, or is it the thing you want to sell the most? Yeah, is it highest grossing? You know, profit? Is it the one that's most frequently ordered by the customers? Mm -hmm. Is it the most important to the company, like which ones? I, I can totally see that. That's a yeah. good conversation to have because, you know, honest truth is it depends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and, and heating and cooling companies, uh, this would be a situation where uh, we're, we're on step one of the products and we're talking about air conditioners and furnaces and, you know, water heaters sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this discussion turns into, well, we've been carrying um, 
train. And over here, Amana is offering us these deals and we could be making 10% more margin. Yeah. It turns into this huge discussion. And it's like, what other time was this going to come up? Yeah. It wasn't going to come up in other normal meetings because it's a big topic and they don't want to bring it up uh, and have a big topic at their regular weekly meetings like this. And so here we are, we're going through the motions and this is when it comes out. Do we have the right products that we're partnering with? Why or why not? <clears throat> and so what seems like a simple uh, exercise sometimes turns yeah. into this mess and then and then you so, get in topics of should we be offering this product or not they could yeah. have been offering it it has no profit to it yep. this discussion gets real hairy real quick so it goes from you know what are our products and services to to is this the right mix is this the right prioritization are we using the right suppliers as a second tier yes. to that conversation really quickly right okay yeah, yep. that makes sense. I mean, I having seen it and lived it, we had those conversations all the time. But um, often when you're sort of in a products and services conversation, that is exactly how it goes. Where you yeah. go from, go from, this is what we do to is, is should this be what we do? You know, right. are we doing it with the right mixture? So yeah, I think yeah. the ser the services when um, is similar uh, in that. Mm -hmm. Here's what we've been doing. And, and you think about early on, and I got one of these customers right now, early on, they take everything they get. Anything yeah. the customer asks them to do, anything they want to do, the answer is yes, we can do it. You ask these people like, hey, what, what are your services? And there's like a huge list. You ask them what their number one service is. They don't know because they're doing everything. And so they have no anchor service. They actually have no, this is typical of a customer I would bring up. They don't know who they are as a company and it gets worse as it goes they don't quit doing these things sometimes that are not as profitable or because it was one project that was profitable uh they haven't sold it again because there was no clarity or focus yes yes um it's really funny you know like i was in an industry that compared itself a lot to heating and cooling which you've you've been mm -hmm. in and um <clears throat> the whole conversation of residential versus commercial or this product line versus this product line or planned and preventative maintenance versus the selling of service of your existing products, right? Your, right. You know, furnace or whatever, right? Those are just, those are all meaningful in there because they're all relevant, relevant to that, that product group or that type of business or whatever. But you're right. There's a lot of conversation around right suppliers, supply and demand kinds of questions, um, labor, you know, like facilitation of one kind of service and its profitability versus another kind of service and its profitability. And what's the industry standard, you know, like in, in the industry I came from uh, or, or spent a bunch of time in in the last 10 years, um, planned and preventative maintenance of residential was not industry standard. So it doesn't make a difference if we want to do it and it's super profitable. We're trying to teach the industry to think like heating and cooling where annual or every couple of years service is, is absolutely common mm. and needed. Right. And so because customers didn't think it was needed. Now commercial customers totally did because, because their volume was so much higher right. Um, right. in those products, but in residential, not at all. And so, yeah, you're totally right. Like all of that is a very big conversation, moves around a lot and um, is needed to have because you cannot understand who you are until you can understand those things and know what a priority to you is. What kind of company are we going to be is really what that conversation ends up going to, even though it's not really yeah. defined in that way. Yeah. And, you know, and, and not just small companies. I, I run into this. Sometimes the larger the company, the worse this conversation is, believe it or not. Well, that's why they have to have um, them in divisions so that they can all have their own explicit, you know, sort of focus on something. Otherwise, yeah. it would be too convoluted. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, it's, it's a lot of times it's, should we be adding this new service or that new service? Like, and, and so I try not to linger too much on that topic because it gets out of hand. <clears throat> but yep. if there's something really close to them, they're close to it. They've really considered it or thought about it. I will. We might add it on if they're getting ready to bring it on board. Well, I think it's a good place to note because later yep. 
like in your conversations, you're going to get more defined about these things. And as you talk about customer types and as you talk about personas and you talk about how to serve people, you circle back to this exact conversation and you're like, now let's talk about it from the customer's perspective. I don't want to get ahead of myself because I know that's, you know, one of the things we talk about, but Mm -hmm. you just have to start thinking about it from, well, what's important to them? Because it it might be really important to me or really, really high margin, but if the customer does not care, doesn't matter. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Now I talked to a, a marketing strategist this morning on a call and uh, she was telling me that you know, it all starts, her marketing strategy all starts you know, with the customer. Mm. And I was thinking about the, that perspective. <clears throat> I'm used to seeing it start with the initiatives of the company. And so, sure. I, and that it doesn't always mean, it doesn't always align with, exactly with the customer. It could be something that they just want to do. But yeah. the products and services part of it, what seems so simple is actually the hardest thing that we deal with on this, this whole like one page or worksheet that we do. But but here's why I like getting it sat, uh, settled and, and the clarity of these things, because tomorrow you got to bring on a new employee and you have to have, you should have an orientation where you explain to him what your company does. The work that we do a lot of times in these workshops turns into their employee orientation. And so you can walk through, here's the products that we, that we have. Um, we are, you could say we're a service company, products really don't matter, but these are the things that we install. Mm-hmm. Um, service, um, you know, you can say, here's our anchor service. This is the number one thing we sell and promote. And so if you asked uh, somebody in customer service, somebody in your sales, somebody on your C-suite, the, the business owner, you're going to get uh, this, this unity in the same messages of these are the things that we do. It's that confidence that here's the lanes that we're in. Here's the things that we do. Here's the products yeah. we use. And and that is very comforting to employees, knowing that we're all on the same page about these things, or we're not. And in this workshop gives them an opportunity to state their case if if their subset of services or products needs to change change or alter. Yeah. So I have a copy of your company snapshot in front of me, like a, one of your sheets. We've done this right. one together. I look at this and I I think I think exactly where you're going with this, and not just the clarity of having this dialogue and really understanding who we are, but you're right. The passing, we talk about this all the time in our show and in our conversations of just like somebody brand new comes into the organization. How are you going to tell them who you are and what you do? And without going through these stages that you and I talk about, and this is the first one, without going through these and being incredibly clear on all of these things, you, it is in, impossible for you to get it right for somebody brand new. Um, having done this, you know, we, you, when you start off with a mindset of this is who we are and this is what we do, and then going through this process with you, it looks totally different at the other side. Yeah. Once you come all the way through it, because you're like, hey, look, we've put all the leaders in the room together. This wasn't one person's opinion. Mm-hmm. This wasn't, uh, a sur- I like to call this a survey of one, one right. person's opinion. Right. Um, This was not subjective. This was your leadership organization getting in a room and hashing it out and really deciding what's important to you and what is the clarity. And um, night and day different, so much better. Um, I I, that's why I I love this part so much, because it's to me, it's clarity is the starting point to everything, because if you are not clear as a leadership team, no one else will be. I think it's a chance for the CEO and, and others on the leadership team. It's a chance for people to have a dialogue as the why. Why are these the products that we're using? Yeah. The brands. Why, yeah. why is it stop or start and stop here? Maybe the maybe people in the C-suite are learning about profitability on, on products at this point. It yeah. could be that the services, like uh, same thing. It could be that here's why these services, we, we brought them into our menu of services or portfolio of business because because it makes sense while we're in the home or while we're with this commercial customer, we can do this other thing and it ha- has high value or it's added yeah. profitability, increases our average ticket size. Yeah. Here's how that looks on a spreadsheet. And yeah. that, that type of education and cross, you know, the, the conversation and, and the opportunity to look across yeah. the table and, and teach, listen and learn and challenge all those things yep. is so healthy to, to starting this relationship 
and to getting this leadership team starting to look all the same direction into the future of where they're going to yeah. go. Yeah. You know, the, the thought we had here was growth strategy, right? Like, and growth engine is our show and right. we both focus on growth a lot as a marketer focusing on growth, right? I have my opinions about who customers really are and what did they want. And if we don't have this good clarifying conversation about our products and services right now, and then go through this process to where we get to a place where we understand our, you know, our, all the pieces about our business, our customers, you know, and how we serve them. You can't build a growth strategy because you don't know who the hell you are and you, or what you do. And so you're, you, you can't make decisions about how you serve a market or what your industry is going to be or geographics of your business, you know, like whether it's a local and regional or national for that matter, you know, and, and there's just so much in unpack. Uh, it's so valuable to go through this process with somebody, especially, you know, I don't, I don't often get on here in our show and say it like this, but to have somebody who's an outside person come in and, and advocate for everyone having the dialogue and not the CEO having the opinion that's going to be everybody's opinion is so incredibly valuable. I don't think most organizations um if they if they don't have someone come in and do this they they start and end in the same place because i agree here's your opinion this is how it is um everybody just said, gets in lockstep and says yep yep you're right and instead of having a great conversation and transparency about um regardless of where you are in your cycle how mature your business is just ha having a good dialogue about like is this who we are and is this who we should be I like the challenging the norm situation, right? Yeah. Challenging, challenging yeah. that that our current our current snapshot is not what we need to be looking at for the next twelve months, even sometimes yeah. the next month. And so, this this is really healthy. the ne The next piece of it, as a marketer, you yeah. will really love the next piece of this is, hey, where do we provide these services? Uh, and, and so, there's a lot of online business right now, and that's pretty easy. It's either like U.S. or it's you know, across the world, right? Right. For for non on you know, regular you know companies that are online companies yeah. only, and they actually have service or you know it could be B two B or B two C type of situations. Um, identifying where you go to is really crucial. I so I, I've worked in a lot of different uh, companies that are service companies, and I remember being one of my first jobs out of college was for this place called Suburban Lawn and Garden here in Kansas City. Know it and. Yes. It, it, a lot of yeah. If you live in Kansas City, you know this place, right? So they, and, they got some of the biggest facilities in the city for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and the the products are great. They always have been. They handpick. Yeah, um, they've got a great reputation. Yeah, Bill and Bo Stewart own it. They're wonderful people, and um, they they um, they basically handpicked out all their stuff, right? But so they had a uh, they had a lot of different services, and you know, sprinkler repair and whatnot. And the delivery service for all their for their uh, trees and shrubs and rock and and those things. So when people called and said, you know, do you deliver to us? You know, there were those zip codes on the outer limits of the um, of the map. And what was confusing about this was that that at the time that they were really that I was working for them for sure, um, they were really can't say it was bursting at the seams. Yeah, and the, it was one location the, at that time, I'm sure. There was, there was a couple. Yeah. And, okay. and so I know they've expanded since then. I mean, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. So with yeah. They're, stuff, so. they're popping up everywhere, but, and that's what they're notorious for. And a lot of, com uh, a lot of uh, landscaping companies and a lot of um, nurseries, they do this, like they'll go to the outskirts of, uh, of town and as new homes the, are built. Where the new construction is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so we would say we would have our service uh, delivery map, right? And we knew what zip codes we went to. And these, this new housing district went right across the next zip code line. And, and it, it's, so the neighbors across the street got delivered to, and they're saying, I'm looking at one of your trucks right now. Yeah. Like, why can't you deliver to my zip code? And I think that this is really important. So this is just, that's a micro like example of, yeah, of yeah, the yeah, type yeah. of things. And this, this gives you an idea of this. Also, um, if you're a business that does multiple States, um, and you have an opportunity to go to all kinds of States and, and you're ready to expand outside of your area. And having that discussion of what states are we going to go into this year? Because if you say wherever they call us, you might 
not have your pricing and your delivery fees yes. or your 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 uh, project fees. You might not even have your project, uh, you know, price sheets and and price tables configured properly to make a profit to go into these states. And so this is that time again, just like the products and services above, where we get to talk about marketing the service area. But yeah. one thing, and I'm gonna, I'll shut up and let you talk. Uh, no, you're good on this topic because I want you to take this puppy. <laughs> Trice, I come to you as the marketing CMO, right? I need you to do campaigns for us. I need you to do an annual strategy or a quarterly strategy. And I don't have this stuff figured out, the product services, but I don't have the market area figured out. Are you going to come back and ask me where, <laughs> who, <laughs> like, where, you know what? And that's why it's important. To, what's your anchor products? What's your yeah. anchor services? Yeah. Because you have to do something really well first in in the area that you're in before you can start taking that thing out to everywhere else. I love, and where I is love it? Where is that? Question. I love this question so much I, because I have two angles on it. One, I'm a mature business, but I'm a multi location business, right? I, I service. Just your point, Suburban Lawn and Garden is a great example. I service a defined local market, but I'm a national company and I'm expanding into other markets as I grow, right? Mm -hmm. So in every one of those, it's a local market. So for me, the marketer in every one of those businesses, the strategy is localized and has to be because it's wasteful of my money not to be. I cannot do a national campaign because that's just waste, stupid. So I'm, I'm targeted to my geographic. Okay, that's that's fairly straightforward. And if, to your point, yes, if the business really has a good handle on who we are, customers we serve, the types of products and services we offer, I can't do anything until I know those two things. I, I can't do a thing. It's, it's meaningless. Yeah. So you write a playbook basically on, on here are all the things we do when we go into a new market, right, geographically. But one of the key things in this is, yeah, that might be all the tactics that we execute on, but are we actually going to go into that new market with all of our products and services day one? Almost 100% of the time, it's no, mm -hmm. because you can't, mm -hmm. because it's so difficult for you to go in and hire and build a business from scratch in that new area. And you can't. So like, for example, in a lot of businesses, they'll go in and they'll be like, I don't have... I don't have the um, the ability to speak to every consumer. So I'm going to go target specific kinds of companies and do more of an account based marketing type approach where I'm going to I'm going to target specific companies with my salespeople, my marketing, you know, my relationship development. It's because if I can get a foothold in, in a handful of companies and get some revenue going, well, then I can build out the rest of the things I would normally do and, and take a wider footprint. Well, that's a great market approach, right? That is a Fantastic way people can do it because without overextending themselves. And eventually maybe you grow into doing all the things, right? And that that's the hope. But maybe you don't. Maybe you're like, we're only gonna ever do these things because <laughs> this piece over here geographically just doesn't work the same way as it does in the Midwest or some other part of the country. And so, you know, like I'll there's a big difference between Florida and Minnesota, right? Like yes. Right, the kinds of products you might offer someplace will be totally different there than there. Um, so you know, just things like that. It, those are going to have a factor. Code, code. Um, that's code. a huge thing. Oof. California, yeah. New York versus Texas. Taxes, codes, in day. taxes, right? Taxes, like codes, uh, absolutely. Pricing, All of those factors. Yes, yeah. 100%. You got to build them into your pricing. You got to the way in which you go to market in New York is completely different than how you do it in Kansas city. Yeah. Paul wide, very different. Right. So that's all one of my, factors. that's one of my big ir irritations with service companies who, uh, that do surcharges based on where you're located at. I'm not talking about delivery companies. I'm not service no. companies like, yeah. okay, well, yes, we will go out, you know, an hour. Um, but that's going to cost your pricing is going to be this. It's like, yeah. that sucks. It's really hard as a consumer. It's hard to hear that you feel like you've been like targeted. Yeah. It's like, you almost want to want them to say, no, we don't sometimes just because like it, you know, yeah. we don't go that far. Right. Um, yeah. 
But... Well, and I think the other thing is, is think about it from a growth strategy, making the decision to go to a place. The same things you, you kind of alluded to this. What's it like? So I did a project and, and I have a relationship with a manufacturing business. This manufacturing business is in the Southeast. So for them to get into Texas or Kansas or, you know, Missouri or, you know, that that's not that big of a deal. Transportation costs are still an issue. Fuel costs obviously are rising. So that's a, that's a factor, mm -hmm. but to be in the Pacific Northwest or to service California, you can't do that from the Southeast, right? So for me to expand my business to grow, I have to take that into account. What's the best way for me to grow into those markets if they're markets I really want to grow into? So understanding who I am and what I do and understanding where I am and where I want to be, part of this clarity that we're talking about is understanding those things so that I can say with some honesty to myself, if I want to be in the Pacific Northwest, I need to figure out all the factors so that I can make a determination about like, do I need a physical location there? Do I need a distribution center there? Do I need a manufacturing facility there? Mm -hmm. um, what's my shipping going to be like if I want to ship there? Or do I manufacture there and ship up and down the coast? Like all those things are variables. And I want to grow my business. And that looks like a potential market for me. I, those are the kinds of questions I need to know and my leadership team we need to talk about so that we can get to a place where we're saying we have a growth strategy, we have a plan. We don't know how much, you know, we don't have the all the details worked out, but we know this is priority one. Yeah. And you can't get there without this. In doing this snapshot, um, I had two different customers this last week where we had the exact same topic, which is this list of products and services was really lengthy. And it was just like an individual with like a crew and mm -hmm. he's, he's trying to grow it. And, and I, I said, you know, before you, and he, he was talking about going to other locations outside of Kansas city, you know, like secondary, yeah. secondary and, and third uh, size markets. And so he was, he was looking at doing that. He was looking at the expansion of his product lines and everything else. And I said, we have to stop for a second. We haven't proven that you can do one thing because he, he hasn't been in business for more than two years, right? right. Um, and I got another person who has been in business for, for many years and the same problem actually. But um, it's, we haven't proven that you can do one thing really well yet. Yeah. We don't have processes. You don't have processes written on that thing. You yeah. don't have a sales brochure. You don't have a sales process for that thing. You have nothing. You have nothing there. Your website doesn't do a good job of telling me that's what you do. And you, you got like 20 products on there, but I don't know the one yeah. thing that you do well. Yeah. And, and they're already talking about jumping in. The, guess what? You're missing the opportunity at your back door every day because you haven't solved the first step of doing one thing extremely well and owning that, that one thing and being the best at that thing before you start doing second and third. This is the failure of most businesses is they can't focus they can't focus and and have repeated success and proof before they they go and do the next thing well and the next thing yeah well. you're 100 right I, I, way i look at this is part of clarity is understanding where we are in our own life cycle who who we like the product services and things we just talked about but also the how how well can we serve a, a, a customer base and a market and we might want to go into the next adjacent town geographically because it's, you know, like we're, we're doing so well, blah, blah, blah. But we haven't proven we can scale. It, you know, all the things you're talking about are, yeah, you've got to have all those, those ducks in a row right there so that you can scale. But the, the real question is, am I ready to scale? No. And the reason isn't I'm not ready to grow my business. It's I don't have all the things I need to be able to extend my business. I'm, I'm going to, this is going to get harder by extending geographically, right? Or, or adding new products and services is the same right. way. If you're a business and you, there's two ways to grow revenue, right? You either, you either do it for more people or you add more things that you mm -hmm. can do, which then does it for more people. Yeah. So you're like, I can't do any of those things. I haven't even identified all the things I need to do to be able to scale people, collateral materials, messaging, you know, like all of that, you need all of that.
And it doesn't mean you just pull the trigger and overnight you're like, I, I'm going to do all the things. Here's all the money we need to do all the things. Nope. Uh, you, I mean, if you had that much money to invest in your business, you'd have done it, I'm sure. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's, it's then figuring out, well, what do I need to do? What stages do I need to do to get to a place, a plan to grow? And so, I mean, being clear with yourself is also understanding that. And, and can I scale? Am I ready? It's a great yeah. question to have. Great problem yeah. to have, frankly. And, you know. and almost, always, almost always when I'm talking to them, the answer is no. <laughs> I'm sure there's a great business the owner always no. It's, it's, it's a great business. Baby. They're not ready, yeah. but they're going to have a baby, right? Like it's, it's, it's happening, but it's okay. Yeah. What do I have to do to get to a place where I feel like I'm ready? Yeah. There's some great business owners out there that do know, they, they do understand this and they do know this and they're highly organized. And, and I, you know, thank you. Like these guys are mm -hmm. great. Like, you know, I've learned from some of these, some of these guys. And, the, and they know that they aren't going to solve all the problems prior to making the decision to move. That's right. That's not the goal. It's right. I need to get the least the, the baseline of stuff done. Most of them could care less if their website is accurate. It's, it's, that's not going to stop them from moving. It's people, materials, and collateral to be able to execute and do business. Okay. I, as a marketer, I hate that answer, but it's the truth. Like, yeah. I know the website's not going to stop you, but should we have the sales collateral and campaigns and messaging right so that we can tell people who we are and take their business We'll get, and then we'll get to the site, like that, that, the downstream of it as we'll figure that out eventually, you know, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, that's a fair point for sure. Yeah. So, um, you know, and, and most people, um, they will add the additional services and products thinking that's going to solve their profit and revenue problems. Yeah. And it actually deteriorates the situation in 100%. a lot of cases, not all cases, but in a lot of cases it does because because they think that's the, that's the problem is I don't have these other things that other companies like me have. It's like, no, it is always a marketing and sales problem that you have. It, it's those two things. And a lot of times, you know, I, I'm big on sales. You're big on marketing. Here we go. Yep. Um, you're is, right. No, it's both, it it's both of those things are failing. And you think adding products is going to be the answer because then you can upsell and cross sell. It will help you maybe. In some cases, it just it just takes your focus away from the main thing, the thing that's at the top of your list here, on what you sell and what you offer customers. Yeah, and if your if your are margins bad. eroding, additional products and services or geographies, customer bases mm -hmm. is not going to improve that, margin. Mm -mm. You might get cross sell. You're right. There, it's if you're if you're selling more than one thing into the same customer base with the same conversation, same relationship, maybe. But each of those things has its own margin. Every every one of those products is its own margin. So you're not necessarily mm -hmm. getting improved margin. You're getting more transaction. You know what yes. I mean? Like, yeah, as a whole, the bill is bigger and therefore the company's margin might be larger, but it's not really true because each of those things has a price point. You know, there's cost for you, there's shipping to you, like every one of those. So each, it's more just, you've added additional margin points, you know, for different, different line items, yep. but you're right. All the stuff on the back end. I mean, yeah, those are, you know, accounting and marketing and all these things like people wise might stay the same and you get like some scale out of it that way. Just think the about this. That it's just your margins is going to explode all of a sudden. It's just not real. It's just you think about matter. this. Look at the conversation we're having. Can you imagine the conversations that I have with, and watch these leadership teams talk about this. I'm sure it's explosive. I sit back and watch, and I'm sitting there looking at my, you know, I have to keep it on track, right? And I'm like sitting looking at my watch, going, "Crap, it's lunchtime, and we don't even know what products we." Sell. <laughs> and, Having and sat so, through all this, I can and, tell um, you right now, yeah, it's it's a bunch of strong personalities because you don't get to the top without having one. A bunch of strong personalities arguing with each other about, and, and not in the mean way, just like yes, it's a, it's a hot, it's a hot button. So you're like, yeah. God, we got to. I, I didn't realize we were so far un unaligned on these ideas. That's what it, comes out of that to me usually. Yeah, and they're, they're they're you know a lot of times they hired me to fix people problems or things like you know uh, organizational stuff, and I'm like, they don't understand. This is why we start here. This is the beginning of your people problems. Start with you don't even know this stuff. So yep. how can they possibly have confidence in their leadership in their company, right? Yep. So I want to go to the next thing just for yeah. the sake of yeah. covering a few more things before we have to get off today, which um, the total. So so competition. This topic alone can be huge. So I don't want to go too far into this, but we do record it. I ask, 
what's your top local competition? We're looking like three to three to seven of your top competitors. And sometimes that's really hard. And some companies that are really unique in what they do, they, they maybe have one or two, um, or it's not, they don't have any actual competition that does exactly what they do, which is a great situation. Um, but But a lot of times they have a lot of competition. And I always define this. I'm not sure how you do, but I define their local real competition as the people who they quote against. Yeah. I, here's the first thing. No, I'm, I'm, I can't believe I'm going to say this. I don't care about competition at all. Could care less. And the reason is I don't ever feel like that's what we're really doing. I don't ever feel like what we're really doing here is competing against somebody else. And Maybe that's really naive of me to think that way. But the truth is, um, I feel like if we're really well-defined and we have um, just amazing execution, competition means nothing to me at that point because we're going to win. And it's really not even about winning and losing to me at that point either. We're going to get great margin. We're going to grow the business. We're going to have great customer relationships. That's all I care about. Like, hey, look, if, they, if those guys down the street do well and, and we do well, awesome. It just means the market's growing and we're doing our part to keep, keep capturing that. So I think that this... I'm more worried about executing than anything else. Like if, oh, I, I I get think you. if, we, if we're screwing this every day, we're, not, we're just... That, that failure is what eats at me. It's not what are those guys doing. It's our own internal thing. That that's, what, that's what drives me and... I know that's rare. I know most people don't. Well, I think a lot of I think a lot of C-suite people think too much about competition. That's what drives you. Okay. Yeah. So, and this is this is I've heard this for most of my career. You know, we don't have competition, right? Oh, no, we don't, sure we shouldn't yeah. worry about the competition. Okay. I've heard all this, right? So not everybody feels that way. Okay? I know. Especially yep. especially if you're say in sales and you're going against other quotes, then you then you feel competition every day. Yep. So here, here's what I would say on um, this competition thing um, is some people are wired better and perform better when they're in the game and they have another team they're playing against. Yeah. And I was, I had a call uh, last week actually from a client. He says, Hey, we went through all this process and we didn't name who our villain was. <laughs> and I knew right away, like, is that story brand? <laughs> It's one of these, one of these programs, story brand. And I, I said, uh, I said, okay, well, if you need a villain, we'll, we'll come up with one. Like that's okay. So not everybody feels that way, right? Somebody wants, sometimes they want the other team. So they have, feel like they actually have a team they're beating. Yeah. And I think the difference is, is a lot of CEOs don't want you to follow the same playbook as, and they don't want you to think that you have to follow the same playbook. And so they tell you that they don't have competition or there's nobody like you. That's where I agree. Carve your own path. But having having a villain or having competition is important for some people. And this is not to tell people we have competitors we're worried about. But if you actually took this to a new uh, somebody who was in a CMO role or a marketing role or an agency, they're going to ask you who your competitors are if they're smart. Because they need to go look at what the competition has done so yeah. that you don't do the exact same thing. So it is for the purpose that you want as a CEO, yeah. is that you don't want to do the same things. But um, understand that that's why this is down here is because yeah. people who have to go out and perform need to understand what the, the, other, the other scene, the other views look like. So that they can go with a strong in with their strategy and approach and represent your company well. There, there's two traps. So I, I gave you my personal opinion is yep. on competition because it doesn't drive me. Yep. But you're right. I'm not in sales directly the same way. I don't quote against someone. I don't, I'm not out there having the same kind of frontline dialogue. So my, what, so what drives me is different than what drives somebody like that. That's hundred percent true. As a CMO, I look at it. Um, there's two traps when you talk about competition. One, to your point, the idea of saying, well, nobody does what we do. We have no competition. Well, what that really means is either you're not, you don't really want to identify your com- competitors, but the real truth is it means if you don't, if no one does what you do, then it means the market standard isn't the same. 
the market standard is something else over here. And now you have to move the market because you do something yeah. new and unique. And this is what innovators have the problem yeah. with, right? If you come into the market, the reason adoption looks the way it does is because it takes a lot to get early adopters to move from industry standard to the new standard because yes. it's not a standard. It's not the predisposed default that most people think about in your industry. So, and that's really hard and it's an uphill climb, but it, once you hit some momentum, it, it can really carry you if you're the innovator, if you're truly first to market with something new. But the idea that it's, you don't have competition is ridiculous because it just means that the market believes something else is the standard and you haven't convinced them otherwise. So that's the first trap. The second trap is we know who our competitors are and here they are. We identified them. Boom, 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 boom. Now the trap is we watch what these guys do and we want to be like them. Oh yeah. What no. the hell for? Right. No, the point is not to be somebody else. The point is to be better than somebody else. So like even when I, who don't worry about competition at all, mm -hmm. what I look at things are as like an agency would, I do not want to do what they're doing. I don't want to just replicate and repeat. I want to do it differently. Even if the mechanism's the same, you know, oh, we have a podcast and they have a podcast. Cool. Talk about different shit. Talk about the right. shit from your angle. What's your perspective? You're a subject matter expert. What's your perspective? Let's talk about it. That's the whole point. Your messaging is different. Your standard is different. What you do is different. Your people are different. Of course, you all say you have the best. And of course, you all say you love your people. Just get over that. Tell us why. Tell us the story. That's the difference maker. And if you can do that, you're going to be fine. If you're great at storytelling, frankly, if you get all this clarity right and you're great at storytelling, you're welcome. You yeah. just, there, there's the growth strategy right there. Well do those said. Two things. Yeah. I love it. You're, you're, there, that description was beautiful. I, 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 I love this it. Is, I, you, we, we hit these hot buttons all the time. Love Every it. week I come, I just get them like, oh, this is going to be kind of a nice little episode. And then I get into the middle of it and I'm like, <laughs> my head fucking comes off my shoulders because I'm like, oh my God. Oh. Well, got to get it out, brother. You got to get it out. <laughs> if you're still watching this far in, thank you for one. And two, this is what happens every week now. At this this point in the episode, yes. one of us becomes unhinged. It yeah. Usually me. So and it's fine. the best stuff. So you got to hang on because our best stuff is the last part of our this episode. This is where it is. Time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the last thing I'm going to talk about, I have many things on, on this sheet that we get through that day, you know, company stats and what have you. The, the last one I want to talk about on the show today is the online competition. So I, I talk about the there's a difference, and sometimes they're the same, but often not. Yeah. There's a difference between the competition you have currently and that you have been running up against, and there's these guys that come in stealthy. You don't know they're coming behind you. They're coming in stealthy. They're new company, or they just got bought out. They got money, money being poured into the company. They're yes. rebranded. They've yes. got a new website. Here's the challenge. Here's what I run into with this. The thing I'm there to solve as a, as a business coach, the thing I'm there to help them with, and, you know, whether it's branding or organization, sales, marketing, anything, is, is the thing they've recognized as missing that somebody else just has solved or multiple people have solved. So it starts with what's the core problem that, that my, cust my best customer has, right? Yes. What's the core problem I'm solving with my services or products? And then you find these websites when you search, you find out what your top key term search terms are, you know, yep. if you don't know, find an SEO guy or, or ask somebody, you know, to just call me it for you. Well, I'll help you figure it out. Like, call, yeah, call, call Trice. Yeah. I mean, and then Google it and see who comes up on page one and then go to their sites and look at how they've answered. Sometimes your site's better than theirs. Congratulations. That's done. Yeah. A lot of times you see somebody who's come in and it's genius. They've answered that. They really understand the things that we're trying to do in this in this session, right? They understand who they are. They understand the core problem really well. And their homepage doesn't sell products and services. It sells a solution to the problem. Yeah. And they have killed it. It looks like a mature company. And they are like, they just started. They're months old or a year old. And you didn't see them coming as competition. But now you see how well they're put together. And guess what? Your company is now on the back side of this and you are now not looking like a fresh company ready to serve your, your, your customers. And so that, that's why I separate these two. I want to yeah. know who you're, it, they may have no top of mind awareness. 
they may not be a na- name that everybody knows, but but when you don't watch them because of the, what they've done right, in, in the next 12 to 24 months, they're going to dominate in a part of your market. And if you don't pay attention, you'll lose out. And when I say pay attention, I'm talking about if you don't redo your approach, redo your, you know, refresh, rebrand. If you don't have the right marketing messages, your site yep. isn't redone to, to counter that. You have to do what you do well and observing what other people do well is a compliment to them. Yeah. And, you know. For sure. We talk, this, this is to kind of ekes into where we talk a lot about um, SWOT analysis and stuff like that, obviously, but um, and you and I have talked a lot about sort of building products and home services and transactional businesses like that, manufacturing. We talked about that all today. But when you look at this from, let's say, a SaaS business, which I just came out of recently, or e-commerce, right? Like there, are, and, and even if you are not an e-commerce business, but to your point, e-commerce is just people selling online, right? Let's simplify it, right? It doesn't mean D to C on their own site or Amazon or something else, right? But but all of that. If you don't look at these types of competitors to figure out, just to your point, are they're tackling the problem from a different angle or they've taken the next step in the evolution of this problem and they're solving it, you know, via um, you know, their their own website or or some other e-commerce platform, right? Um in SaaS, where it's a software tool or it's in your e-commerce you're selling, this is like a, a must because that's where this whole thing has shifted, right? Like 10 mm-hmm. years ago, SaaS wasn't even a term, didn't exist. Um, e-commerce was real, but it was in its infancy in comparison to where it is today. Sure. And to be honest, it does not make a difference what kind of product or service you sell now. It's all sold online in addition to the face-to-face portion that it's more of a traditional business. If you're selling, you know, if you're IBM and you're selling million dollar enterprise level software packages, there is a ton of personal contact, but also it's sold online. Like that initial interest from a marketing organization, you know, with a customer coming in is, is the vast majority of it is, is internet driven. So if you're not looking at your competitors and saying, do we have any or first what are the competitors we've already identified doing online and two do we have any that are online only that we just don't didn't see coming and it, it's a great question because it really helps you sort of fill out the total you know landscape for yourself of where do we stand versus where does the market stand and this obviously is the next segue into a, a, a fuller sort of SWAT type discussion because this is a market driven analysis where you're looking right, at, right. at the whole group and saying wait what are they doing online versus what are we doing online and if you're frankly if you're still asking yourself those kinds of questions you might be in a little trouble you need to push the curve on that that's where sp- speed online is where it's imperative because it can get out of hand so quickly mm-hmm. and competitors can come in you know the example you just had of somebody acquired somebody this just happened to me like i was in a business and it was acquired by another business in, in the e-commerce space. And the way that they're going to leverage that group as a whole to compete against the landscape of the market is, is the whole point. Um, that's why they made the acquisition. Um, so I, this is super common. I mean, I'm not you know, saying anything out of turn here. People just need to look at this to have a really good full scale understanding of what the landscape looks like. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and I know, um, there's a lot of things you can put on this. Sure. It, it people ton, on this sure company, we miss. Yeah. On this company snapshot, people want to put all kinds of things and, and I, they're not wrong. Um, it's just that in my series of, and, and the order in which I do it, this, this is step one. And some of the other things that you would think of like mission core values and th- those types of things, they do happen. They're just, they're, yeah. they come after this. And, and so yeah, um, so this is the step one of the process. Just to do what we just said, you, this is what gives you the lay of the land. You're not you exactly. not necessarily come out of this and say, like even with products and services, we have a very clear understanding of what we should be doing, who we are right now, because you haven't right. done mission and values and differentiators and persona. You haven't done any of that work yet. It's just hey, now we've identified where we stand versus where everybody else stands. We've identified a lot of the questions that we had going into this of 
that we didn't really realize we had, you know, and now we can say, right. how do we solve those? How do we, how do we answer those questions for ourselves? What's the best for us? And I think clarity comes out of a lot of, a lot of things that, that not just me, but coaches like clarity comes throughout everything they're doing. So this is, this is, you said lay of the land. I like that term. Um, in, in the snapshot, I, I, I call it the snapshot. Um, yeah. And so this whole session is great clarity, clarity for them. And so I guess my, you know, just to wrap things up, my ask, I think for businesses, small, mid-sized businesses, both, no matter where you're at in, in the, the business growth and journey is that this is an exercise that you do with your leadership team. You do this, or if you're a solopreneur, definitely do it. And I think you'll find this exercise is really healthy. And um, every time that I've been involved in a website build, um, this one pager type of situation where you can turn around and just give it to a a web designer or builder answers most of their questions, actually. Um, What do you do? Uh, Where at? Um, You know, who's your competition? So they can look at other sites so they don't repeat and look like them, right? They can can take this one sheeter and go to town. um, Yeah. You know, and, and so... I think this is an important step for every company to do. If you want some type of a template to use, reach out to me, please. You can go through our website. Just let me know that you heard this podcast episode and you'd like that template. Um, yeah. I will provide a template for you so you can have something to go off of. Um, but if you do start with just product services, market area, competition, those types of things, like that's really the, the, the strongest part of what this is. Um, and yeah. That's yeah. I, that's, so I, just to layer in, I th- I think this we talked about vision last week as one of the things people want from their CEO. You want to figure out how to get it, your vision for the future. This is a great first step because if you can get this with your team of people, if you can get this kind of clarity to start things off and then go through the process of defining the things, you know, bring in a coach or a fractional or somebody to help you in some way, shape, or form. And it doesn't have to be us, just somebody, right? Like mm-hmm. it's important to go through this process with somebody from the outside. So you can go through it and at the end say, I have very good clarity now of who we are and what we can do. And I have a great vision for where we're going and how we can get there. And the leadership team's on the same page. Great. Now you can ha- now you have something that every one of your employees wants. They want somebody to tell them, where are we going? How are we gonna get there? And with some confidence, what that means to them in their business. I mean, that's, that's where inspiration comes from. Stuff like yeah. that. So, you, you got it. Absolutely. Well, thanks. That's, that's plenty of time for the day. Um, and for this episode. So, uh, hope to see you guys next week when we launch our episode six. So, uh, comment down below. Let us know what you think of the show. Give us ideas for future topics. Uh, thanks for joining us. Yeah. Thank you everybody.